In this video, we'll talk about how to do the calculations for the amperometry lab. So the lab handout gives us the Cottrell equation, which describes what factors lead to the current at a certain fixed potential in an electrochemistry experiment. Right, so in this experiment, you fix the potential, you watch how much current comes out of it, and we want to relate that to physical parameters so that we can get a number out that's useful. In this case, we're trying to take the current we measure and turn that into a chemical reaction rate because chemical reaction rate depends on the concentration of glucose. So we gotta go from current to reaction rate first. And we're measuring the reaction rate of hydrogen peroxide because that's what's the electrochemically active species but the nice thing about the glucose oxidase enzyme is that it turns glucose into hydrogen peroxide, and so we can measure hydrogen peroxide and use that as a stand-in for glucose. Okay, so what's in this equation? So we have I parentheses T, and so this is the current at a certain time, and the lab handout suggests to use 10 seconds for this time, and so you take your plot that you measure, you find what the value is at 10 seconds, you'll get some current, it's in microamps, and it's probably like three or five or 10 or 20 microamps, something like that. And so that number just goes right here. But to make the units work out, we're gonna to wanna to convert that into amps. And so when you're doing this in Excel, you'll take the current value, multiply by 10 to the negative sixth to turn that current value from microamps into amps. Okay, and then pi is everybody's favorite pi. This is the square root of pi, so in Excel you'll say 3.14159, that's enough digits for now, to the exponent of 0.5. Then we have n. So n is the number of electrons transferred in this reaction, and so here's the electrochemical reaction we're actually looking at. There's two electrons transferred per mole of hydrogen peroxide, so n is equal to two. So then in Excel, you'll have a two in there. F is Faraday's constant, 96485 coulombs per mole. This is the charge on a mole of electrons. A is the area of our working electrode. And so the working electrode is a two millimeter outer diameter circle. We'll convert that to centimeters because it matches other units we have. And well, you gotta find the radius when you wanna find the area. So you divide that by two. Area equals pi r squared. So pi times the radius, that's our area. So now down in here in Excel, here's the area that we put in. We had Faraday's constant in N previously. So D naught is the diffusion coefficient of hydrogen peroxide in a solution such as this. This value we just pull from the literature, um, 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth centimeter squared per second. That's the diffusion coefficient. I put the citation here. Yes, there really is a journal called Physical Chemistry Chemical Physics, PCCP. Then T is the time since you started the experiment, and so that's 10 seconds. Now, let's think about units, because that's always a really important thing to do to make sure you didn't screw your math up, honestly. So here I have the Cottrell equation as we have it rearranged. I pulled all the units in. Let me actually zoom back out so we can see the original equation as well. Now, here's the current. I'm going to take amps, amperes, unit of current, and convert it into coulombs per second, because this is the definition of an amp, it's charge per time. And then pi doesn't have units, n doesn't have units, so I kind of left these little blank spots here. We really don't need the little lines. Okay, and then Faraday's constant has units of coulombs per mole. The area, we convert it into centimeters on purpose so that it matches other units we have. The diffusion coefficient is centimeters squared per second. Once you take the square root of that, you get centimeters per seconds to the one half. Then you have time, the square root of time, so that's seconds to the one half. Now, pretty much all of this stuff cancels, right? The coulombs cancel, the 
Um, seconds to the half cancel. Maybe I shouldn't say pretty much all of this stuff cancels. A lot of it cancels. But we're left with centimeters cubed. So that's here, centimeters cubed. We have moles. And since you divide by moles twice, that brings it up to the top. So it's over here. And then the seconds is here. We divide it by seconds, so that goes down to the bottom. Now we want to convert this into something a little more useful. And so the logic here goes something like this, in that, well, this is mole per cubic centimeter. A cc, a cubic centimeter, is one milliliter. So I just changed that to moles per mil. We're almost to molarity. This is actually kilomolar, which is not super useful. But if you multiply this by 1,000, and I justify why this works down here, you multiply this by 1,000, then your milliliters that are in the denominator turn into liters in the denominator. And moles over liter is molarity, our friend. And so then here we have molar, change in concentration, per time. Or really concentration per time, but, you know, it's a rate, so we're looking at change. So, cool. So this is concentration per time. That's our rate. That makes a bunch of sense. So here's what we have in Excel based on what I've just talked about. Now, again, this is in kilomolar, the way we calculated it. We haven't multiplied it by a thousand yet. So then what I did in Excel is I then took this, which is, you know, this whole thing, right? I took that and I just multiplied it by a thousand. And then it gave me something that's in units of molar per second. And I thought that was super helpful. So, you do this for each one of your samples that you ran, and they'll have your standards will have different glucose concentrations, and then your unknown will also have a different glucose concentrations. And then what do you do with it? Well, one problem we run into is that the rate of this reaction is not linear with the concentration of glucose. And that's a problem because when we do standards in a calibration curve, we're usually assuming something's linear, or at least that we know the relationship between the two. Turns out we do know the relationship between the two. So for this to work, we need to deal with the michaelis menten kinetics. And so I'm not going to derive this all here. I'll link a video for this. But the idea behind michaelis menten kinetics is that you have a first step where the enzyme and the substrate, in this case glucose, um, have an equilibrium step to make a complex, and then the enzyme breaks the, or does whatever it's going to do to the substrate. In this case, turns it into hydrogen peroxide and some other stuff. Um, and so that you can derive for some assumptions, whatever, whatever, to get the rate of reaction is equal to this. And that you could just do this, right? You could plug in your rate of reaction here. You could plug in glucose concentration. You could solve for things. But it's a lot easier to do this with a straight line. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, use the linear version of this called the line weaver burke plot, where it's a double reciprocal plot. So on the y-axis, we have the inverse of our reaction rate that we just calculated and a little earlier in the video. So you'll make a column in Excel that is one over this rate you just calculated. That goes on your y-axis of your plot. And then x is one over the substrate concentration. So you take your glucose concentration. Um, I suggest putting this in molar. So you may have done it in millimolar. So convert it back to molar and then invert it. And then this gives you units of one over molar. And that's good because it matches. I mean, it'll work without it, but it's good to have your units match. So you can make those match. This is what you have on your x-axis. Cool. And then you'll get, hopefully, something that approaches a straight line. You can fit a trend line to it, just like normal. And then you can plug in your y values of your um, unknowns, which you'll have had to do the previous calculation on that, right, to turn it from a current into a reaction rate. And then you take the inverse of those, right? Plug those in as y. And then you solve for x using your trend line equation. x comes out as um, inverse glucose concentration in 1 over molar. So then you take 1 over that, right? You uninvert it. And then you get your concentration of glucose in your unknowns. And then you're set, right? So we have to do this step because we're going to use the equation of a straight line to... Um, calculate the glucose concentration in our unknowns 
and we need to convert everything into a format where the relationship between glucose concentration and what we're measuring is actually linear. So that's why you need to do this step also. All right, happy calculating.